Well, good morning. It is a, a privilege to be here today. It's always a blessing uh, to be invited to, uh, to be a guest uh, in the pulpit. It's a particular blessing to be invited back as a guest in the pulpit. So I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, opportunity to be back with you again uh, this morning. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, that's where we'll be uh, this morning. As we start, um, I want to kind of go ahead and offend half of you. Um, <laughs> there are two kinds of people in the world. Uh, there are those who uh, begin celebrating and decorating for Christmas before Thanksgiving, and there are those who wait until after Thanksgiving. So it's just, just a quick poll. If you are before Thanksgiving, would you raise your hand? No, not unashamed. All right. If you're after Thanksgiving, raise your hand. All right, there we go, there we go. For those of you who are before Thanksgiving, we'll be having an invitation at the end of the sermon. <laughs> you can repent, and uh, we'll be praying for you. I'm going to break my own rule this morning and, and preach somewhat of a Christmas message this morning. It's not really Christmas, but our passage this morning does uh, consider and speak to the incarnation of Christ. Uh, and so, uh, as I've prayed this week about what to share with you, the Lord laid First John on my heart, and I don't really have a, my goal this morning is really just to, just to look at the text and explain it. Uh, I don't really have any uh, new doctrines that I want to bring to your attention or new ways of doing anything. I really just want us to walk through the text and see what John said and see how that applies to us today. First John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, reading from the New American Standard, the Bible says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning it is a blessing, God, to be able to open up Your Word and to, and to, and to preach. Lord, I want to thank You for the folks who are gathered here. Lord, I want to thank You for, for Pastor Richard and, and the invitation that that I have to be here. We pray your blessings on him as he preaches. God, bless his time with his brother uh, this weekend. Well, let that be a sweet time of fellowship and with him safe travels home. Lord, in these next few minutes, as we, as we look at this passage, I pray the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. God, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things from your book. And Lord, that you would, uh, God, just bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. In this book of 1 John, John writes to the church about eternal life, about assurance of salvation, about living the, the genuine Christian life. So this morning, I want us to see how John begins the letter, really just follow what he says, and I think in it we'll see some foundational truths for discipleship. And when I say discipleship, I mean specifically what it, foundational truths, truths that are necessary in our personal walk with Christ and us following Christ together. So this morning, look with me again in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 1. He begins by saying, what was from the beginning? What we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you eternal life, which was with the Father. As we look at this passage, it it seems as though John's talking about a thing, right? What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at. But then he says what we've touched with our hands. He goes on to say later on that, that this what is eternal life. This what was with the Father and was manifested to us. So we, we come to see as we read through this paragraph that this what is really a who. That the what here is, is Jesus. 
Similar to what he does in in John chapter 1 that we heard earlier, in the beginning was the Word. John begins the first phrase of this letter with what was from the beginning. Now, you you know as you open up God's Word and, and you read the epistles, you read letters, usually they start with a greeting, right? I, Paul, to the church at Ephesus, right? Grace and peace be to you. Usually there's a greeting in there, right, as we come to letters. And when you flip over to John chapter 2, or, or sorry, 2 John and 3 John, short little letters, John has a brief greeting on those. But John chapter 1, there's no greeting. He just jumps right in. He jumps right in with this. What was from the beginning? As he writes a book about the Christian life, about an assurance of eternal life, about what it really genuinely looks like to follow Jesus, he starts with, What was from the beginning? First point I want us to see this morning is that as disciples, those of us who are followers of Christ, who have come to a point in time in our life when we've repented of our sin and trusted Christ, and our life is about following Him, as disciples, we humble ourselves under the pre-existence of Christ. John begins with the pre-existence of Christ. What was from the beginning? The beginning. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But as we heard in John 1 again, right? John 1.3 says that all things were made by Him. That is, by the Word, by Jesus, all things were made by Him. And without without Him, nothing was made that was made. Paul reiterates this in Colossians 1 when it says, all things were made by Him and for Him, that He is before all things, and all things in Him hold together. Jesus Himself said in His discussion with the Jews who were claiming Abraham as His father, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. I am. You see, the the Jesus that we follow, the Christ of our discipleship, is a pre-existent Christ. This same, G, this same John who wrote John uh, first and second and third John also book, wrote the book of the Revelation. And in the Revelation, he quotes Jesus as saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, as we are looking to follow Christ, it's so important that as we, we, we remember that the Jesus that we follow is not just the Jesus of Bethlehem and Nazareth and Calvary. The Jesus that we follow is the Jesus of Genesis 1. The Jesus that we follow is the Jesus who has always been. Francis Chan uses an illustration that I like. and he has a, He'll come up on stage and he'll use a big, old, a big long rope, right? Just, it's just long, even, it goes off stage. And he says, this rope represents time. Right? And there's a point in which it begins, and then, and then there's a point, and this little part right here is your life, and there's a little red tape that's wrapped around a small little section of it, right? Long rope, and one little small portion is your life, right? It's a good way of helping us to see how we fit into this, this time. I think it's important to remember that, that Jesus is outside of time. And if we look at that illustration, Jesus is the one that made the rope. You see? He's eternal. He's pre-existing. He's not merely a good teacher. He's not just a moral example of kindness and self-sacrifice. But the Jesus that we follow is the one that was from the beginning. So how do we respond to this? How how does this fact, this truth about who Jesus is, His pre-existence, how do we respond to that? Well, we humble ourselves under it. Right? Right? We, we, come to, we come to follow Jesus with this understanding that He's not just a mere man. That He is the eternal God, the captain of the hosts of heaven, the one on the white horse in the final battle, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, following Him is not optional. Failing to do so is rebellious treason. And it's made even more grievous as we think about how good He has been to us. John began his letter jumping right in by saying, 
the Jesus that we follow was from the beginning. But he continues in verse 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. So how do you go from this eternal God who has always existed, and God is a spirit, right? And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Jesus says, uh, no, God is invisible. No one has seen God. The Son of God has explained Him, right? So how do you go from this, this eternal God being a pre-incarnate Christ to now the second part of verse 1, seeing Him and hearing Him and touching Him? And so we pick up with that in verse 2. And the life was manifested. And we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you eternal life with the Father, and was manifested to us. So as we move from from the first part of verse 1 to the second part of verse 1, how this immortal, eternal God can be seen and heard and handled, and the answer is, He was manifested. Point number two, as disciples, we glory in the incarnation of Christ. Even though I don't celebrate Christmas, I I don't decorate or listen to Christmas music until the day after Thanksgiving, I love Christmas. That's a struggle every year. Every year this time, I have to fight urges to pull out some worship music about Christmas. I love Christmas. I I enjoy thinking about how God is with us, Emmanuel. How is it that, that the immortal, eternal, invisible God can be heard and seen and touched? And the answer is the incarnation. One commentator said this, It is both true that there never was a time when the Word was not, and also that there was a definite moment of time when the Word appeared, when it was manifested and experienced by human beings in this material world and time and space. John, who wrote 1 John, also wrote the Gospel of John, and he said in John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Peter said in, sorry, Paul said in Philippians 2, Although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he took the form of a bondservant and was made in the likeness of men. You see, he was manifested. I think think too many times we just assume that God owes us this, right? That God is God, and and He's there, and and in order to save us, He sent Jesus. But the truth is, for God to put on flesh and come and to dwell among us, that's a great gift. He didn't deserve it. For God to to put on flesh and walk among us. For Jesus to show us what God was like in the flesh. He didn't deserve that. He didn't have to do that. But what a blessing. I think oftentimes we, you know, a couple of of decades ago uh, when I was uh, in the youth group, uh, WWJD, right, was a big thing, right? What would Jesus do? People were asking, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do, right? But oftentimes I've come to find out that those who that those who are asking, what would Jesus do, wouldn't take the time to read the Gospels to see what Jesus did. You see, we know what Jesus would do. Because God sent Him to come and to do it. The incarnation. We glory in the incarnation of Christ. Notice what was used here in verse 1. Paul says, what, we, what was from the beginning, what we've heard, and we're going, to get back, we're going to come back to hearing and seeing and looking and touching in, in our third point. But he says, concerning the word of life. And now verse 2 is kind of a parenthetical in this paragraph as John now thinks about what he means by when he says the word of life. But notice he says word. Again, the same, the same word that's used to describe Jesus in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. Right? He uses it here as well. The word of life. The word that is life. The word that gives life. The word that is life itself. The word. Why, 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 was, why is it the word that, that describes who Jesus is and what he did when he came? Because 
Because when God chose to communicate with us, He sent Jesus. In a, in a way similar to the way in which our words communicate our thoughts and our intentions, when God wanted to communicate His thoughts and His intentions, He sent Jesus. His final word. His definitive word. He is the Word. Hebrews 1.1 says it this way, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways, right? God spoke to the fathers and the prophets, lots of different ways He did that, but the writer of Hebrews says, in these last days, He has spoken to us in His Son. He's spoken to us in His Son. That's, that's how He has, has, has spoken to us. That's how He's communicated to us in His Son. To the patriarchs and the prophets, they had the opportunity of knowing about the coming of a Messiah in a veiled way. Right? They knew that the Messiah was coming as far as a promise, as far as in prophecy, in type, and in figure. Every, and sometimes we see that, 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 that the Son of God appeared in human form in the Old Testament. These, these appearances uh, in, uh, with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace right? to Joshua as the captain of the host of the Lord and as the one who wrestled with Jacob, right? We see these appearances of Christ in the Old Testament here and there. But those patriarchs and those prophets in the past, they only saw Him in that way. They did not see Him incarnate, in actual union with human nature. They did not have Him dwelling with them or conversing with them as the apostles did. What a blessing it is as we see this Word. Not only is He the Word, but He's the Word of life. Life. Again, echoes of what we hear in in John chapter 1. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shone in darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. He's life. John 11, Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Notice verse 2 again. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you. Proclaimed to you what? Proclaimed to you the eternal life. And notice, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. It's clear that John is saying that Jesus is eternal life. Eternal life is not not merely something that Jesus gives. It is a person. It's a relationship that we have with the person. Life. I love the way that nouns are used to, uh, in a positive kind of way to describe Jesus. We see this in, in the Christmas story of Simeon. You remember Simeon? God had told Simeon that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. The eight-day-old baby is brought in. The baby Jesus is brought into the temple. and Simeon knows this is the Messiah. Here, Joseph, bring the baby. And he says, Lord, now your servant can depart in peace, for I have seen your salvation. Your salvation. This baby is the salvation of Israel. This this Jesus is eternal life. So how does this truth affect our following Jesus? You see, we're to be grateful that God has come near, that God is with us. We worship and glory in a God who has chosen to send us His Son. These are foundational truths to following Jesus. This isn't, again, not that this is bad, but this isn't having a time and a place and a plan for a quiet time. right? That, you need those, right? But if Jesus isn't an eternal God, and if He hasn't become man in the flesh, then there's nothing to have a quiet time about. Point number three, as disciples, we experience the person and work of Christ. As disciples, we experience the person and work of Christ. Now, just a little bit of a background here. As John is writing, it seems as though, as he's writing in the first century, that there's already a, a, a set of false teachings that's beginning to attack the church. There were those, there were those who were saying, in, in, a, in an, I believe in a genuine effort, Maybe not, but maybe, maybe not. But there were those who were saying that Jesus wasn't really a man. He just appeared to be a man. He didn't really come in the flesh. It just seemed as though he came in the flesh. 
He was really a spirit being that had the appearance of a man. There's a false teaching known as asceticism. And I believe that's that's part of the background to what John is writing here when he says in in verse verse 1, that's not true. Because we've heard him, we've seen him, we've touched him with our hands. We know for sure that's not true. Look look, look Look at verse 1 again. What was from the beginning, what we have heard. See, the disciples of the first century, they experienced the person and work of Christ. You see, it's interesting. John could have argued for the actuality of the incarnation based on theological reasoning or or logical necessity, but rather in this case, he chose to offer a personal testimony. You see, the reality of Jesus' earthly existence had become the focus of John's entire life. His interaction with this God-man had totally changed and eternally defined the rest of his life. He says, what we have heard. I wonder if John, as John's writing this, if he's thinking about some of those things that he heard Jesus say. John was the youngest of the apostles, probably at the time of the writing, the last apostle still living. He called himself the beloved apostle in the fourth gospel. I think he had a special relationship with Jesus. As he's writing what we have heard, I wonder if he's thinking about When he was there, and he heard the voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I wonder if he he looked at the woman, if he remembered the time when Jesus looked at the woman that was caught in adultery, and he says, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. He heard Jesus say, rise, take up your bed, walk. He heard Jesus say, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. In the upper room, he remembered hearing Jesus say, this is my body that's broken for you. This is my blood, a new covenant. He was there when Jesus was on the cross. And he looked at himself, John. And he looked at his mother at the foot of the cross. And he said, Woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. Now before his death, transferring to John, Christ was caring for his mother. He heard Jesus say, It is finished. After his resurrection, he heard Jesus tell Peter, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Based on the time of the writing, either just recently or not too far from now, John will have heard Jesus say in his visions that he records in Revelation, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. John says, heard what he said. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. Surely as John wrote this, he thinks back to those things that he saw. He saw gallons of water miraculously changed into the finest wine. He saw the man with the withered hand who could not outstretch it, stretch it out. He saw the one that was blind be able to see. He saw the one that was lame be able to walk. He was there when Jesus stood at the tomb of his very good friend who had been dead for four days. And yet he saw that friend live again. He was there on the mount. When Jesus appeared with Moses and Elijah in all of His glory. Jesus was transfigured before Him. John was there. I believe that's what he means in John 1.14. When he says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. When did He behold His glory? When Jesus showed Him His glory. And He was transfigured before Him. John says, we've seen these things. 
He saw Jesus appear in the locked room after His resurrection. These things that we've seen. What what they heard and what they saw was so important that after Judas had betrayed Jesus and killed himself and it was time to pick a new disciple, the primary requirement for that new disciple is that he had seen and heard and been with Jesus from the beginning. The disciples experienced the life and work of Jesus. And then he goes on to say what we have looked at. What we've looked at. He just said what we saw. What's the difference between what we saw and what we looked at? Well, as a husband, I face a similar situation. My wife says there's a difference between hearing and listening. I'm not sure I want to admit that today. I think it might be used against me in the future. But if there is a difference between hearing and listening, I think in a very similar way there's a difference between seeing and looking. John remembers those hours that he sat at the feet of Jesus and just gazed into his face as Jesus taught them about what the persecution that would come. As he taught them about the heaven that he was going to prepare for them. As he taught them about about the way and the truth and the life. He, He watched, he intently looked at and stared at Jesus as he was tenderly caring for the children that came. Then he says, we handled. John remembers when Jesus would hug him, embrace him. He remembers Peter grasping Jesus' hand as Jesus lifted him out of the waves after he began to sink after walking for a short period of time. He remembers most clearly when Jesus appeared to Thomas and said, see my hands and my side. He ate breakfast that Jesus cooked for him After his resurrection in John 21, he he handled, he touched. So what is this truth? How does this truth affect our following Jesus? See, we weren't there. We didn't see, we didn't hear, we didn't touch. Listen to what Jesus says. Speaking to his first century disciples, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen believe. You see, we don't, we don't have a second-rate faith because we weren't there physically as the first apostles were. In fact, our faith is still an experiential faith. Let me say that again. Our faith is still an experiential faith. Now be careful. It's not based on experience. It's based on these foundational truths that Jesus is eternal, that Jesus was incarnated, that He died and He rose again, that He's coming again. That's what our faith is based upon. But our faith, our faith is experienced through experience. You see, in the mornings, when I open up my Bible, God speaks to me. And I hear Him speak. Not audibly, unless I'm reading the Word audibly. But God speaks. This God has spoken. And when I pray, I speak to Him. And when my faith is weak and I call a friend, and He reminds me of the faithfulness of God, I experience faith. When I join with other believers in partaking of the Lord's Supper, and I eat the bread and I drink the cup and I think about His body that was broken and His blood that was spilled. I'm spiritually nourished. I experience His faith. You see, as disciples, we experience. Fourthly, quickly, as disciples, we proclaim the gospel of Christ. Notice what he says in verse 2. This life that was manifested, we've seen, we've testified, and we proclaim to you eternal life. Verse 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. As disciples, we proclaim the gospel. Notice those three verbs in verse 2. We've seen, we testify, we proclaim. 
Right? We come to understand, we see it, it, we are exposed to it, we testify that as we bear witness with it, we agree with it in spirit, it comes to understand that that really is true, and then we proclaim it. Peter and John, Peter and John, right? John who wrote 1 John, after being arrested and released in Acts 4.20, he says, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. So the Great Commission still applies. John is proclaiming. You and I as disciples, we continue to proclaim. It's interesting that uh, this, the, verses 1 through 3 are all one long sentence. And we don't get the main verb of that sentence until we get to verse 3. We proclaim. It would have been smoother English if we started out with, we proclaim what was from the beginning, right? I think the new, the new NIV does that to kind of smooth out the, the language. But, but when John wrote it, he saved that verb for later. It's almost as if he wanted to front this other stuff up to say what we proclaim is what's important. We need to proclaim it. But what's important is that we know it and we proclaim it. Not necessarily how we proclaim it. We proclaim it. Fifthly and lastly, as disciples, we share and rejoice in the community of Christ. As disciples, we share and rejoice in the community of Christ. Look at verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. That's the sharing. Fellowship. Sharing. John says, we're telling you this, we're proclaiming this to those who are lost so they can come in and to those who are saved so that we strengthen this fellowship that we have one with another. You see, Christ is building His church, a community of individuals who have been reconciled to God by His death and put into fellowship with each other. You see, the the fellowship with the first apostles is based on the person and work of Christ. Listen to that. John says, we share this, we proclaim this to you so that you may have fellowship with us. When a 10-year-old boy bows his knee beside his bed, realizes he's a sinner and separated from God, repents of his sin, trusts Christ's death on the cross as payment for his sins, and commits that day to begin living for him, something amazing happens. A bond is established between him and John the Apostle. A bond is established between him and a persecuted pastor in China. A bond is established between him and you, if you're a believer of Jesus. Because it's through the truths that John is announcing that we have fellowship one with another. The church is not an association. It's not an academy. But it's a community of those who partner together based on a shared experience of life change because of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's not just that that we are an association of people who have the same kind of life change. But our fellowship is such that you and I are both individually being changed by Jesus because of who He is and what He's done, but we are together as a body being changed together because of who He is and what He has done. We are experiencing this fellowship together. And he continues and says that fellowship in D, verse 3, Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. See, it's because of Christ's death that this fellowship is possible. We who are far off have been brought near. We who were enemies have been reconciled. Fellowship is now established both within the body of Christ horizontally and vertically as we are one with another fellowshipping with Jesus. But then in verse 4 he says, These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. You see, we share and we rejoice in the community of Christ. There's a joy that's present for those who are following Jesus that is unlike anything else. John Piper calls it a serious joy. 
It's the kind of joy that's able, like Matthew says, when you're persecuted, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. It's a joy that's there regardless of circumstances. It's a joy that's there that's confident in the Jesus who said, I am coming quickly. It's a joy that is, that is built on a future in which there's a place prepared for us in heaven. It's a joy that withstands the storms of life. In the upper room, Jesus talked to His disciples about a joy that would follow their sorrow after His death. Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As John begins his letter, he shares with the church some truths. Truths that will help protect them from false teachings that might come. Truths that are foundational. Foundational to what it means to follow Jesus. So now what? What follows is John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Rest of the letter. What follows is John saying, So God is light. Don't walk in the darkness. So, don't say you don't have any sin. Because all of us have sinned. The one who says he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. But God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Repent of your sins. Trust the one who has made propitiation for your sins. Live out your life as though you're living an eternal life. Love the brothers. When you find yourself in sin, don't, don't stay in sin. Don't keep on sinning. That's what comes next. If you and I, based on these truths, living a life that's worthy of our Savior. Would you pray with me? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, as we get ready to pray, Maybe this morning you've come to realize that Jesus really is who the Bible says He is. For the first time, you've personally understood that what He did, He did for you. I'd encourage you not to leave this place this morning without speaking to someone about that. Repenting of your sins, trusting Christ, following the one who was from the beginning. Maybe you're here and you're, you're, you're a Christian. I would just encourage you and challenge you, not, not, not from what I've said, but from what John has said, what will you take away this morning? What is it from what John has said that you need to do differently? You need to feel differently. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the opportunity this morning, God, to look at it. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to follow you better because of who you are and what we've done. In Jesus' name.